Um, I'm going to start the gospel two verses before chapter 14. Yeah. So, the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, o Christ. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also, and you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, I have been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And in fact, will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. I moved to Berkeley six and a half years ago and I really thought I was only going to be here for one year. I was fresh out of college, unsure of what the next step for me was, and very glad to be away from home, literally 2,800 miles away from home. <laughs> and as the one year stretched into two, into three, into seven, into <laughs> even more now, it was a good five years before I realized that I wasn't going home. And now in year seven, I don't quite know what to even think about home anymore, at least in the ways that I used to understand it. And now in seminary, this temporary outpost with a countdown timer, mm. I wonder how I and we are to settle in here, a place where settling in is not really an option. So allow me to welcome you all into this liminal space with me. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Seminary is weird. <laughs> we won't be here forever, either this physical space or in this head space. I don't want to just project, but knowing what I know about many of you, this period of time, though good, can also feel a bit untethered. Has it been? Do you call this place home? If you don't, what do you think it would take to make it home? What even is home? Is it a feeling or a state of mind? or a particular people or place or sense of stability, or is home just a sort of nostalgia for a life that we once led? 
That sense of feeling unmoored is a theme that also saturates the passage from John 14. This farewell discourse is its own transition point. Jesus has entered the place that he will die, Jerusalem. A particular literary lens might say that Jesus is in fact already dead, that his fate was sealed as soon as he entered the city and the wheels of fate had already begun to turn. Neither he nor the apostles can go back to their lives before Jerusalem, nor can they stop time and remain in Jerusalem forever. They also can't hurry ahead to what's next because unlike us, voyeurs to their plight, they don't have the entire story written out before them. They simply must move through their liminality in real time, abiding with their feelings of hurt and confusion and doubt. So we might extend our question, is it possible for Jesus and the apostles to feel at home in Jerusalem? Jesus's words are promising home in a sense, but commentaries disagree on how to even talk about that home. Feasting on the Word says that the dwelling places are, for the apostles, real places, the places with Jesus, where Caroline Lewis asserts that the dwelling place isn't a real place at all, but rather a hearkening to our resurrected life, our ascended life. So is the temple with Schrodinger's Jesus kind of dead already, not quite dead yet, is it home for the apostles, or are they just biding their time for another home in the future? And if we think home is right there in the thick of it with Jesus, shouldn't it feel less bad, less liminal? Beth Dixon says that Jesus probably feels pretty bad too, thinking about his own forewarned betrayal and crucifixion. Can anybody win here? As if to complicate things even more by putting a third leg on this stool, it's also Lent, and the same themes of confusion and grief and unsettledness are what define this time. Our liturgical calendar cycles through periods of celebration and grief, closeness to God and distance from God. And Lent is one of those low times we Christians call ourselves an Easter people, a people of the incarnation. We do not often tout our identities as people of the desert. We may be good at it, we may be afraid of it. We might even enjoy it, but we do not hang our hats in this season. Lent is a sojourn, not a way of life. What I hope I'm articulating here is a thread of continuity between these three things, seminary and Lent and the temple. They're each a liminal space with a beginning, a set period of time, and an expiration date. And not only does our time in each of these things end, but they each end with a bang. <laughs> an Easter, a graduation or an ordination, a change in the ways that we see ourselves and relate to the world. Though I know the hope of that change doesn't always help us feel any more settled, especially if we are grieving the life we used to live or if we can't imagine the life to come. But I wonder if our embrace of Lent or our embrace of the temple can help us inhabit our own liminal times differently maybe better. I wonder if maybe we can use any one of these three legs of our stool as crutches for the others. Again, as the John 14 commentaries posed, is there a way for us to look forward to the place that is being prepared for us while also preparing a place for ourselves right here? I hope so. I think it's possible, although I know that we don't tend to love the tension between the present and the future. 
But I wonder what it would feel like to believe that home isn't a set of material conditions or a particular place, but rather an orientation to God's work in our lives that can happen anywhere. What if home was the place where we learned to see the face of God in all people? What if home was not something that you felt, but something that you had to practice over and over and over until you could do it well, and over and over and over again until you couldn't do it wrong? To borrow the words of Coach Monica from Cheer on Netflix, Maybe that perfect sense of home really exists only beyond the far horizon, that dwelling place with the Father in the ascended life. But maybe we can learn to approximate it well enough right here, well enough to call this place home too. We'd be working uphill, I think. It's easy in spite of all of this to make simple human reductions. Our lizard brains tell us that good things are supposed to feel good and bad things are supposed to feel bad, and home is supposed to feel like home. But I suppose all I'm trying to do is to muddy the waters here. Maybe home isn't just a feeling, and maybe neither is faith. So how do we do it? It's kind of my hunch that we all know how to be home already how to enact it. I think we just need permission to do it here, in the desert, in the temple, in Berkeley. I do wonder, though, how believing that this place could be home, how that might change our relationships with God. I wonder what it would feel like if we could believe that Jesus was with us in the wilderness, rather than the one that we left behind back in Epiphany. If we thought Jesus was wringing his hands with us in the temple, rather than chiding us for simply not having enough faith. If we stopped thinking that our calls were somewhere in the future and started believing that they could happen right now, here, with one another, imperfectly. If you need that permission to feel like it's worth it to make home here, you have it. Go ahead and give yourselves over to the work of calling this place, these people, and this time home. And then when you leave here, take it back. Give it to some place else, some people else, some time else. And know that if we really believe Jesus' words in this gospel, and I think we do, that the same God who is waiting for you at the end of the road is also with you on it. Maybe the way really is the life, even the seminary part of it. Amen. Amen.